coming in the uh, in the coming months with the uh, completion of the merger with Tralee and the uh, establishment of the Munster Technological University. So Tom uh, at present is, is based in uh, IT Tralee where he divides up his time between uh, lecturing in social science, uh, but also leading out, I would say, on uh, all matters e-learning related or uh, laterally all um, matters relating to uh, remote teaching and learning. Uh, Tom is uh, very well known for his, uh, his research and indeed his advocacy work with respect to uh, open access in, uh, in all of its forms. But in this uh, presentation, he's going to be talking uh, more specifically about uh, open educational resources, that is free to use, uh, openly licensed um, teaching and learning material that uh, anyone can take and, and remix um, as they see fit. So in this way, open educational resources, as we see it, uh, bring a lot of benefits with them uh, particular, I suppose, or in particular in the COVID-19 context for saving uh, teaching staff uh, time and uh, duplication of results and building on the work of others. But I'm sure as Tom will get into, OER is also a movement and an ideology that uh, people can uh, contribute to, which brings its own uh, benefits. So I think Tom's going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And then whether you're on Zoom or on YouTube, we can take some questions and uh, hopefully have a bit of uh, discussion as well. Now, unusually, I'm uh, controlling the slides here. We had a bit of a hitch with, um, with Zoom there. So Tom, you might direct me uh, in, in terms of uh, when, when you want me to bring up a new slide. Cheers. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, and as I said, it's it's delighted to be asked. And uh, please God, we'll all be in the in the, the one place in a few months' time. So I think uh, uh, certainly, if anything, the the COVID uh, pandemic has certainly thrown up a need to be uh, sort of innovative and and agile now. Um, so yeah, greetings here from uh, Sunny Kerry, but uh, don't let the accent. Uh, so there's a bit of a disjointed there. Um, as you as you'll get to know anyway um so are we yours um yep yeah, so i suppose on the on the next one apologies it was a slight bit of a hick so uh garod will have to move, move stuff along here so the paris declaration and the, the, and as garod was saying in the introduction it is very much a, a, a movement as part of a with the berlin declaration paris betsy the, but the, the, just strictly speaking just to be quite clear about it are those resources which uh, teaching, learning, and resource materials in any medium, digital or otherwise? So I suppose like that's the thing. I mean, in, in theory, it could be a painting, a PDF handout. So what? Obviously, because of the the way we work and the and, and the situation we find ourselves in, uh, it, it generally does mean to be digital. And the idea is that it resides in the public domain or have been released on, under an open license that permits no cost access use adaptation redistribution by others uh, with no or limited restrictions and uh, as i said we, we we've seen a lot of people struggle uh, to access material so i suppose that the, that's one of the beauties about open access and it's it's i suppose it's fine while people are often uh, students of a, of a third level college but one thing that people often sort of uh, also say is that they haven't got uh, access to a wide range of material once they once they graduate and uh, you know in terms of as I said the whole thing being a, a movement it's very much a sort of philosophical commitment to openness I think uh, particularly for those of us who in, in the vast majority of us in, in higher ed and, and education generally work in the public sector and our wages are paid for by the public and the vast majority of research is paid for by the public and yet often the, the public don't have access to it so it's a, it's a, it is that sort of commitment we saw all the the uh hci three level or hci three funding there released that's all public money so as i said that's it. and you actually see now in in uh, plan s the eu commission two years ago made a commitment that by 2020 all publicly funded research should have a commitment to to openness as I said, uh, the, the public paid for it, so they should have they should have access to it there. So what does it sort of look like in its various forms, OER? So in the next slide, um, we have a, a, a diagram from, from White and Manton. 
And he talks there about, or the white, the white mountain talk about the surface is a small amount of highly visible licensed OER, so officially bears the name of the institution. And below the surface, I think realistically, that's where an awful lot of us are, are walking. Um, below the surface, often invisible beyond the specific course, is much greater volume of reuse uh, of other non-OER digital resources by staff and students. So stuff which is out there and it's available and being used and reused. So as you can see, a lot of it, as I said, the vast majority of it is actually happening. We're paddling away underneath uh, the surface. I suppose the other thing though, that we do need to be clear about what we're actually using and what rights we have. It's fine with the, the, the stuff which is uh, available and out there. And we, we all have a good understanding of a lot of those uh, course materials and stuff which are available. People uh, may be familiar with uh, you know, Coursera and, and, and another big MOOC provider. But as I said, every time you use an open resource, now the problem is, I suppose, that in terms of the difference between open and freely available, free and freely available is not necessarily the same as, as open access. Uh, and as it, when we start drilling into the, some of those, uh, some of those debates there. And I think there is an acknowledgement that even the term OER is, is somewhat, is somewhat of, a, of a fluid thing. So what we're talking about here is specifically uh, license open, open education resources, which, which we know we can, we can use and reuse and remix. Well, on the next slide there, but I'd say like just to set it in, in context, that, that whole idea of the movement as such, um, and obviously movement is in uh, inverted commas because uh, it, it's a very much loose sort of coalition, if you will. Uh, although, as I said, thanks to the EU Commission, uh, also the Bill uh, and Melinda Gates Foundation have that commitment to openness. But there's a whole range of things which could be described. As, uh, I suppose the, the open data, uh, once again, where there is a commitment to share uh, a, a lot of, of the data, uh, which is freely available. And that ties in very much with that idea of the open science movement. Uh, and yeah, as I said, to make all of that material available. Uh, the open access publishing, um, we have a situation here, which I, I think is, is, is quite crazy in, in, in the sense that uh, the majority of us in, in higher education, we're encouraged and supported to, to uh, write and publish and, and research and publish and stuff. Uh, but the reality is there that uh, a lot of the stuff is locked up behind paywalls. So, and then our institutions then have to pay access to access the journal, which we gave our work for free. Uh, a lot of our colleagues reviewed all the work for free, and and then yet the publishers are are, are sitting behind that that paywall. So that that's one of the the other commitments there about open access publishing, uh, and we're trying to uh, sort of change and, and break down the perception that uh, an open access journal is no less inferior, it's no less rigorous, but it is that issue there. Some of the earliest manifestations of the whole open was the open source coding, where people were were sharing codes probably going back to the 80s there, so would have been one of the first elements of, of that idea of, of sharing. And I suppose one of the other things as well, like with the uh, with the internet, uh, it has certainly made it far easier to share all that material. Obviously open source software, uh, a lot of us use, use open source software, um, but I think increasingly, I suppose one of the things just to sort of, to be aware of is that, um, software which was used in classes there, we need to ensure now that they're GDPR compliant and, and in terms of protecting privacy. And, and I'm not against it by any stretch of the imagination, but just something that we need to take to bear in mind. Open textbooks, it's a huge movement in America, in North America. Um, the cost of textbooks is, is extremely prohibitive uh, over there. Uh, not so much uh, this side of, of the Atlantic, but and so certainly that idea of, of a commitment to open textbooks, and I'll talk about a resource there. Um, open teaching, I suppose one of the biggest examples we've seen that is MOOCs, uh, this uh, idea of massive open online courses, which has certainly taken uh, on a huge, a huge movement over the last uh, five, six, seven years. Although the early, the promise of the early years, I'm not so sure that has, has, has manifested itself. Uh, open pedagogy, and for me, open pedagogy and open education resources tie in very much there. The idea of open pedagogy is where the students become co-creators, and that's something that I would do in terms of you know working with, in terms of 
encouraging students to, to, to become co-creators in, in the idea of open education resources and open badges. This idea of, of walking through courses and, and actually uh, acquiring badges. Uh, the National Forum for, for Teaching and Learning in Ireland has a whole host of, of uh, badge courses here and uh, some of them have been developed here in CIT. So once again, that whole openness commitment um, to making stuff uh, available on an ongoing basis. And then of course, then actually where we're looking at is, is in terms of open educational resources, which, which is obviously the, the, the idea of the subject that, that, that we're looking at here and what it might look like. Uh, I should, however, though, on, as I said, the next three slides, but the next slide here definitely need to give a shout out to, to Jean Rick and, and, and her staff. Uh, sort, I don't know how familiar people are, but the idea of the Southwest Open Research Deposit. Um, so the, as I said, if you haven't uh, checked it out, that's the idea there that uh, we're, we're, because the thing I, I, I think often that people are very happy to often share and are encouraged to share their material, uh, the data, the research, whatever it is, uh, but where do you actually share it and how, how do you do that? So I just wanted to give a big acknowledgement there. On the next slide, then, uh, we actually have a list of, of where you might particularly find OERs, the Mason OER Metabinder. And uh, and you can see here on the right, there is a load of uh, resources here. Uh, OER Commons, in, in particular, the Open Textbook uh, Library, uh, JSTOR, uh, obviously, there. So there's an awful lot of resources there which uh, make it easier to find, to find OERs. And I think that's one of the things you have with this idea of commitment to OER. Um, I'm a big sort of fan in sharing those OERs amongst amongst course boards and stuff. And while we often think of sort of informal uh, reading groups, I think it's certainly a good idea for for people within a department or or a faculty or a school to find some way of sort of uh, alerting their their colleagues to resources which they have found. And hopefully, I think that's the other the other part of the call out will will also be to encourage people to think about contributing. Uh, open uh, educational resources. So that's one of them there. And I think as I said, that's uh, the, the website there is, is, is linked. The next slide then as well also has, um, once again, uh, this is the OER Commons. Um, so as I said, it, it's just a sharing of, of, of information out there like that. And it's find it easier to, to actually find the, the, the content. So I, I just picked uh, two of them as at random there to, to, to where to find OERs. On the next slide then, uh, BC campus or British Columbia campus, I, I find it a particularly good uh, source of material. I, I've used their open textbooks for a number of years. And the beauty about using the open textbooks, uh, as we we'll see then in the one, one thing which makes it an open, ac an open education resource, um, is that it enables me to do things with it and the students can actually engage with with those resources can take them can modify them can 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 become those ideas of co-creators but uh bc campus as i said there's a lot of resources there i think anybody who's interested in open access in general open education and oers i think you could do a lot worse than actually check out the bc campus uh page as well so i just wanted to highlight there's a lot of resources there and uh, as I said, certainly uh, uh, with Sword and Jane Rickon and the library staff and, Sh and Sinead and, and Trez, I think mean, CIT has really put its, its colours to the mast because I think, uh, I, I think it should be a part of what we do in higher education is this commitment to openness. We're all publicly funded and I think we need to find, if we talk about new ways of engaging with uh, pedagogy uh, with our individual students. I think uh, open access and OERs in particular gives a, a new way of creating that idea of, of content uh, co-creators, but also then you're sharing your expertise outside of, 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 of the, the, immediate, the immediate sphere. So what exactly then, and that sort of brings me on to the next slide then there, and I've, I've heard a, a good description of OER can be considered uh, to mean free plus permissions. Um, because as I said, free, uh, we often conflate the words free and open. I've done research looking at what's called bronze open access uh, publishing. And what that means is that uh, you'll often see journals will often make a, a 
article uh, freely available. The problem with that is they can withdraw that at any particular time. So it's not open access. Uh, they, they can, and as I said, I've had situations over the years where I would have built maybe a, a some sort of activity around uh, around uh, a resource, which uh, you know I assumed well, before I understood the difference, um, I would have assumed that, that that was freely available. But as I said, it certainly didn't mean open. And that's where I said we're open access, or we're open, or making it into an open education resource, is then that you do have the different, the different permissions. Uh, so in the next slide, then, I don't know if people are familiar with Creative Commons, but these are the logos here, which enable us to, to sort of understand um, what we can actually can, can really use. So it's a sort of sliding scale from top to bottom with the most open and, and the least open here. And so you may have seen the CC is always the Creative Commons. Um, and then said that, you know, the, the, the one that we're, we're or sort of uh, open for is the idea is to, to, to completely to share and then once once all you have to do is just give acknowledgement of who created the work but after that then you can do different examples the sa to share alike uh, means that all the derivatives must be shared with the same license so whatever license that you download it you must download it and pass it on again if you do anything with it non-commercial and for in higher education here then as I said, we're allowed to take stuff as long as we don't actually charge for it. One of the things that you really do need to be um, uh, aware of, though, and it's the equal science here, is the no, no derivatives. The work can be shared, but you can't do anything to it. And that may be useful to you. Like you, you might just be happy to just use it. Um, but as I said, you're not you're not enabled to, to change stuff. So, for example, one of the things that I, I like to do with my students is I will take an open access publication get a, get a journal paper a pdf and then we'll insert comments into it or we will do something with it so as i said while the uh, article itself might be freely available to share um if we can't um if we can't actually uh do anything with it it's of limited use for me in terms of open pedagogy it's useful in terms of open teaching in the, in the sense that i'm actually able to use it uh, to, to share the material, but in terms of making it a no we are I want my students to work with me and create. So you just need to be aware of what those different licenses are. Uh, and David Wiley to sort of help us understand what does what what did those mean. Uh, on the next slide we'll talk about the the, the five R's of, of OER. And these these are where this is the real nuts and bolts around OER. So the fourth one there, the content can be reused in its unaltered original format so as i said that you just share in a class study group whatever way you want but you're literally just sharing it and you're using it in an unfettered way to retain it and that's one of the issues here that you can store it then for your own personal archives or for students the right to make own and control copies of the content and that's the thing what does an oer actually mean is that as i said going back to that idea of the bronze open access or the free um, it, it's, it's a very limited use in terms of long-term retention. The big one then for me then is that it, it, it ability to revise, as I said, you could, you could translate into another uh, another another language or, or, or amend it, change, change the colours of it. The diagram might have been very useful, but you, you're able to, 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 to change it there. Um, you might, uh, for example, want you take the video and you might cut it up into segments and, and do something there different with it. So you're able to revise that then to your specific needs. I mean, the problem is said, like sometimes you might find a particularly good video, but there's elements which are, are not as useful for you. So that's the, 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 the rights. On the next slide then, the, the, the other one then is also the, the ability to remix. So you actually take stuff and actually mash it up then uh, as i said like what they call a, a mashup so you're actually creating maybe uh, a, a video of this and a text and you're you're bringing them together and you're actually creating a, a, a new element all together and finally then the right then to redistribute redistribute it now that could be around the class but you can also make make that freely available so that's effectively if you're looking at a truly a, a, an oer that's what you're actually looking at and the creative commons uh, gives you an indication of what permissions that you have to use. So 
while there is five hours, I wouldn't say every single one of them, um, every every single OER would always necessarily have, particularly it's like like the no derivatives is, as I said, you 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 can you can do lots of stuff with it, and you can you, you'll obviously be able to retain it and redistribute it and use it, but you certainly can't remix or revise it like that. So, uh, just to be aware then when when you're looking at someone's output of what what you can actually what you can actually do. So why then would we use it then? So the benefits then of, of an OER, and I've taken this in from the National Forum document in 2015, uh, done by Andrew Rizquez and, and, and others. So I've just taken, and, and these cut across for, for the students, for individuals, for institutions, and then it cuts down on duplication through sharing and reuse of materials. I think that's often the way, like people are sort of, creating stuff and then someone else is creating the stuff over and over again so i, I do think it's as i said it's it's about working smarter not harder I mean, that's one of the things and it's certainly a better use of a public money if someone has has made resources encourage people to to, to use and depending on say if you're using uh, and you know it's certainly enhanced the pedagogy and the students learning experience because you're hopefully using a wider range of resources and as I said, if you want to get into the whole open pedagogy where you make them co-creators you've raised up to another another level you're modeling open practice for students because uh, as i said like without trying not to sound too evangelical about the open education movement i think as i said it does show that that commitment and that you're willing that you know that, that that you're you're willing to to show that you can draw from other people you're not the you're not always the all-knowing all-seeing lecturer that we're quite happy to bring in other other material reflection then on teaching through sharing collaboration and co-creation as i said you may even develop uh, oers uh, you know within, within your department or across across faculties or schools or institutions i think as i said it's it's um uh, I, I think that's a, a, a good way of, of, of looking at the resources there. I mean, there's, a, there's people have made OER and they have YouTube channels. And uh, I just saw there's a guy I follow on Twitter, Michael Seary. He's late of DIT. He's been in, he's professor of chemistry education in, um, <coughs> professor of chemistry education in the University of Edinburgh. And his video hits went over a million uh, hits and said hits great resources, which are out there. And there's lots of, 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 of great stuff out there. So as I said, the stuff that you've, you know, we've all struggled to maybe get across an idea and only if we wish we could find. So as I said, like it's, it's that idea of collaboration and sharing to, to, to people there. Feed, giving feedback to people and, and suggesting, and there's people I would follow and uh, they, they love making stuff and they're always welcoming suggestions where they could make new resources here. If, if if you're going to be going down the, the side of not just being a, a consumer, but also a producer, it helps it attain global reach for your work and increasing reputation for you, for your work, for your institution. And I think, you know, certainly for an, 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 a newly constituted university as MTU will be, I think, as I said, one of the ways it could really establish itself as a genuine facilitation of, of openness uh, and, and, and producing these, as I said, like when we talk about what counts in, in, in terms of academic output. I think definitely OERs need a, need a higher recognition. It creates more innovative approaches to engaging with content that better address the interests and preference of students. We, we keep hearing about Generation Z and who like different ways but uh, of engaging. I think also for our own sake, as, as people teaching year in, year out, it, it helps our own professional and personal development, which then obviously, you know, increasing digital literacy, both for the students and for yourself, um, and as I said, that, that idea of ongoing professional development, learn through network and collaborating, which, which sort of sums up the points I've been talking. The, the, the document goes into a lot longer there, but as I said, it certainly makes a strong case for, uh, for that. Uh, and I think, as I said, we should certainly give, give uh, strong consideration to, as I said, and, and, you know, to use, utilizing them. And then the more you use, use OERs, as I said, I think hopefully you start moving into that idea of open pedagogy where you take stuff and you start to revise and change things a little bit yourself and working with the students and with your colleagues. That said, obviously, then on, on, you know, the next issue then is the quality problem then, uh, as I see on the, on the next slide there. And I think that's one of the issues there. There's a number of other stuff around in, in institutional level, like sustainability about 
are we going to be given the time to produce our wee yards? And I certainly just want to acknowledge that. But the big one, I suppose, is the concerns with the quality. And if we reflect back on, on like the, the iceberg, what was visible above the water and what was below the water, I think that was certainly one of those issues there that there has been that, 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 that and, and, and that's the reality. I mean, yes, there is millions and millions of OERs and objects out on the internet, but it does take some time then to, to just sort of consider uh, in, in terms of, of how we might, um, uh, you know, how, how we might evaluate them. Um, so, um, and that's going to take time. I'll be the first to, to first to acknowledge that. On the next slide, then, it's the first of, of three slides. Then it's taken from the BC campus, and I won't I won't go through. But I think it's a useful resource, and uh, this is freely available. But so what I've done is I've revised this here. This is revision. I've taken it and split it onto three three different PowerPoint slides. So at its most basic, that is a revision of it there. But it's just a way of feeling, and I I think it's probably not a bad idea as or are you develop one and, then, and as I said you could develop a checklist for OERs and that in itself can become an OER or the department or the, the school or the faculty might de might develop a, a, a guidance or or road and, and the colleagues there I, I, I think it certainly makes life a bit easier if you think about sort of having some sort of quality assurance going forward that yeah you have run through some sort of of checklist about establishing you know where you're using stuff and at least and if you're making recommendations to colleagues or friends that you know at least you're, you're, you're confident that you have done it a little bit more rigorous so the next slide then uh, just same again it's just it's just and i think accessibility i think you need to certainly consider about accessibility there and the licensing i think is another consideration it's just a question there so that's just the, that's just the document there and i i put it down and i definitely would recommend as i said people checking out bc camp uh, uh, bc campus so on the next slide then as i said i, I another uh, national forum document produced in may 2019 the national forum open license and toolkit and i think that idea about creating as well as consuming about how do you actually if you create something and as i said it could be a pdf it doesn't have to be anything very fancy but it could be a resource that you have found useful and your students have found useful and you can help sort of uh, turn it into a resource and, and and give it the proper the proper licensing and i think certainly that's one thing that I think we need to need to sort of start considering uh as i said it's great producing though or uh, consuming those oers but i think if we can start as i said it might start off with where you've taken two or three other oers combine them and remix them and then you feel that you've made a, a better way of doing things so as i said it's, it's i think it's the next logical stage for anybody who's commitment committed to oers that and say because yes, i'm sure there is loads and loads of great practice going on in, in Cork as there is in every college and it's about sort of not hiding your light under a bushel so to speak I suppose that's the thing that I, I, I would encourage people to to consider and think about there so on the final slide then just just sort of uh, things there like the, uh, the commitment to openness in its different forms as I said where it's publishing open science data whatever it is I think the OER is just part of all that um Garod here, and I'm just, I'll be teeing him up here that I think one of the things that I'm very excited about, I think with, with Canvas is that it has a feature and I'm going to get Garod in to talk about uh, the Canvas Commons. I, I, I don't think it's been used as much, but often I think it's that, there's, that people have a commitment and are, are philosophically when you're talking about OERs, they're quite happy to, 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 to produce something, but how do you host it? How do you get it out there? You have the licensing toolkit, but where is it going to go? So this is just one of the things that I think you, you need to think about. And once again, another shout out to, to the library staff and so on. As, as I said, I think it's uh, of the different libraries around the country. And I'm not just saying it because uh, this is actually a CIT uh, presentation I'm doing, but there's a genuine commitment. And I think it's 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 one of the things I've seen there uh, uh, with MTU. It does you know, seem to have a real commitment to openness. Um, so as I said, I think with SORT, there's, a, there's another way of, of sort of sh showcasing uh, the work of staff in CIT and hopefully then in MTU. So uh, 
I think that's that's sort of my whistle stop uh, tour of, of OERs. I've probably gone two or three minutes over, but happy to have a chat or, or what way we'd like to do now. And thanks to Garoud. And I put you on the spot about the canvas comments. No, no, not at all. But uh, in case I don't get the chance um, or forget to, to take the chance, I love Baltimore for a play to. Is that Baltimore, West Cork, uh, Tom, or Baltimore, US? Excellent. Good man. Um, so thanks a million for such a comprehensive and well-informed uh, presentation. Um, a great balance there, I think, folks, between, I suppose, the theoretical stuff and the and the ideological stuff on, on the one hand, and then um, a lot of uh, practical stuff as well, you know, in terms of where to find OERs and what to watch out for, things to watch out for with regard to using OERs in terms of different um, different kinds of Creative Commons licenses and uh, issues to do with, uh, with quality. So uh, that definitely uh, fit the bill, I think, Tom, in terms of what we had asked you to, uh, to do. So thanks uh, very much for that. Uh, with respect to uh, Canvas Commons then, uh, yes, there's a, there's a way in uh, Canvas and we're going to be doing some, uh, some workshops on this to uh, share um, learning objects, uh, both um, within a particular department or within the whole institute or with uh, other Canvas users uh, around the world, uh, basically. So Canvas has its own kind of built-in um, repository, if you like, of, of, uh, of what it refers to as uh, learning objects, but you can, you can think of them as being, well, resources, basically, and material in the same way as uh, Tom was just talking about. Um, and maybe Tom, we might convince Tralee to uh, make the move towards Canvas and um, we can all become one big uh, happy sharing uh, family. Um, and uh, obviously our, our colleagues down the road in UCC as well are also Canvas users. So some interesting uh, potentials there. Now we had uh, 23 or 24 people on YouTube. We had uh, 11 people on Zoom. So hopefully uh, we can, um, have a little bit of a discussion now if Tom is happy to stay on for, for another little while. So um, I think Dara is going to look at the questions and comments on YouTube if there are any and field them back to us. Those of you on Zoom have a variety of different ways in which to ask a question, uh, but primarily you can use chat or you can take to the microphone. So uh, let us know um, which you would like to do. Hopefully uh, somebody has a question. Yes, funny question. Our observations, our thoughts. Uh, I, I'd certainly, I'd, I'd certainly welcome uh, it. Um, as you can hear, I, I, I'm quite passionate about uh, people who who work in publicly funded institutions. Um, uh, you know, sort of producing a lot of excellent work, and and then I think, as I said, uh, giving people the opportunity to share share that work. Because as I said, I think some people are doing amazing stuff. I, I certainly. Maybe just to begin, um, there is a question from YouTube from Finbar Sheehan, who says, thanks, Tom, for a great presentation. Where would you suggest starting the OER journey? And is there a risk of information overload for students? Yeah, I do think that, that, that's, that's, I often say to students, I say one of the best things about living in the 24th century is the internet. And one of the worst things is, 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 is the internet. Uh, that's not being axiomatic. Um, so, yeah, I think, as I said, uh, I, I think uh, the OER Commons is often a good place. I think the, the thing with, with, with the students and what sometimes what I would do is I set them a task of trying to find uh, a resource, going back to that idea of, of open pedagogy um, with, with very clear guidelines. So if I'm going to get the students involved, um, I will I will sort of um, make it into in, into a, a task there, not 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 a, a summative assignment, but a formative assignment. Um, but for my own sake, um, and if I just try to look for, for material, for me, I subscribe to certain uh, serve, listserv, um, uh, sorry, listservs and like that. I would subscribe to certain people in my area there, and I'm always look on the lookout for new resources. Um, 
the, one of the other good things, I suppose, like been been in some of the list there groups, I'll often throw out a question to people and sort of, you know, in my discipline area and say, does anybody have, has anybody used something like that? So there's two things here, I suppose, just your own professional one and looking out for your own, your own OERs. Um, cultivate a network of people that you can draw upon. For the students, if you're going to get them to, if I've been taking up the question correctly, uh, to get them to actually look up material, give them very clear guidelines. Uh, normally what I do is I get them to work in pairs and give them a very definite task that they're, they're going to come back and we're going to help produce something that they, it might some be, it might, what, what, like at, at its most basic, I will put up a discussion board forum and sort of say, look, uh, will you share a resource, particularly say for tour de fortune students, a resource that you have found to be particularly useful. Now, sometimes it may not strictly speak and be open access or no ER, but at least that's a good place to start. But uh, and what they'll do is by by seeing uh, the discussion with me feeding in, everybody gets a sense of what the quality is. And so what I'll do is I'll say uh, I'll give them uh, uh, find something that you or show me something that you found particularly useful. What is it, and why did you find it useful? So they're just some of the strategies that I've used. Great, thanks, Tom. There, um, there was another question in from YouTube as well, um, where someone was asking, can they take bits from YouTube videos and put them in their own lectures? Um, if one, if, if are we talking legally or, <laughs> um, no, I mean it depends on, on on what terms it was published in. So, um. The chances are you probably can't actually edit it. Uh, I mean, like, often what I'll just do is I'll just do a link to a YouTube video. And one of the things I don't know if people are aware is that when you click on the share, you can actually specify the the the, the minute and second that you wanted to start with. But um, so that sometimes saves because sometimes what you might might want the first two or three minutes of the YouTube video, but actually cutting up stuff which exists. No, you can't actually uh, do. But what, what I would do if there's three or four parts of a longer YouTube video, what I will do is I will do four or five links. So I will say, watch up till this time. And it's a bit of a walk around where I'll have maybe four or five links, each of them starting at. So I'll, I'll say, click on this link and then stop at this point here. Click on this link and stop at the next point. I don't know if that's a little bit of a, a, a walk around, but Garoud, if you... Yeah, yeah, I would do something similar, but um, people may not be aware. You can actually put um, a particular starting point into the URL. So there's a simple way of just changing the URL to put in plus T and then equals, and then it's what, what minute you wanted to start at and what second you wanted to start at. Um, embedding the video rather than taking it and uploading it again um, gets you around a whole lot of trouble, really, because the IP issue then is still on Google, who own, uh, who own YouTube, as you might be aware, rather than on you, because you're doing something entirely different if, say, you rip the video and you were to upload it to Canvas or your own personal website or, or something of, uh, of that nature. In terms of using YouTube videos with Zoom, um, this isn't legal advice now, but what I would tend to do is play the video during the Zoom, during the live Zoom session, but pause the recording before I play it and unpause it after I played it, but share the link for students who are watching asynchronously or who are watching, uh, who are watching afterwards. I don't know if Dara perhaps has anything to, to add there from a, a creative digital media or e-learning uh, point of view. No, that all sounds very sensible and very good advice out of both of you. Okay, thanks, uh, Darren. There's another question in there from uh, Emmett uh, on Zoom this time. So thanks for that, Emmett. Um, so Emmett says he's particularly interested in researching multimedia resources, especially video in his own area of uh, corporate communication. How would you assess the quality of these resources in the OER domain and any particular place to well, essentially, if you start looking. So video may raise um, special questions, I suppose, with respect to some of those quality uh, issues you were you were talking about. And, um, and then the other question is where to start, where to look. 
Yeah. Um, I suppose like, but something like that, that, that specific area there, uh, which the corporate communications, it, 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 it wouldn't really be my area of expertise. But as I said, just going back to what I do in my own area, I just make sure, I mean, for me, and it's most basic, uh, looking for resources. I I think Twitter is one of the best things. I follow certain people. I'm not saying I have to be, you have to be posting all of the time. Uh, so as I said, like whenever people are producing new resources and stuff. Also, as I said, by, I'm on LinkedIn, there's loads of groups, um, so specific groups that, that, are, that are to follow them. Um, in terms of the assessments, as I said, there's a number of checklists that the BC campus one is, is a useful starting point. I think also, I think you need to consider nowadays in terms of accessibility and universal design for learning principles is another thing to to uh, to incorporate in terms of, of uh, what you work in terms of, of, of quality. Uh, the, in assessing the quality of things, I mean, uh, I'm not a multimedia expert. So for me, I kind of think about um, how, well, first of all, if it's video, if, can you, how much, even if it's open access, can you actually revise it? Are you allowed to edit it? I suppose that's one of the first things there that uh, I think if it's video so important to you, I think it, ideally you have some way, just touching on what Garot has said about um, how much you can you can do with it afterwards. Um, but as I said, with, with corporate, uh, for me, I just follow the right people and see what resources are being produced. I shout, I give a shout out to people. And as I said, with regard to the checklist, that's the one I use, but there may be better ones out there for specifically for multimedia. Um, Grows and or Daryl would have more of a thing about multimedia. I suppose there's another angle there as well as the OER movement uh, gains power and, and more people are participating in it, uh, both as producers and uh, consumers, if you like. Um, we can kind of rely to a certain extent on the wisdom of crowds to uh, indicate what the what the quality of things are so oer commons was one uh, website that um, tom spoke about uh, earlier and handily enough uh, it's one of the ones that allows you to search by format uh, mm -hmm. so you can uh, you can look for videos by contrast to to other um, to other kinds of resources and it's also got a kind of a rating system so I don't think it's quite there in terms of say something like YouTube where arguably at least the good stuff rises to the top, but increasingly that is coming to, uh, to be the case uh, in terms of quality. In a way, it probably depends on what the context of use is, you know, yeah. whether the concern is almost like with things like video production um, standards or with the, the kind of the the quality of the of the content almost as it was as it was uh, being said there are a few sites that specialize but it's probably a bit off what you're asking about now but specialize in sharing um video recordings of lectures and you can often find uh, lecture recordings of uh, of really well-known um individuals so i'll try and throw in a few i'll try and remind myself and throw in a few of those uh, links into the into the chat box there but I have found those handy in the past where I might want, um, you know, an openly licensed version of, say, Tim Berners-Lee explaining why he invented the web or something. something why he gave it away for free. And, and, and uh, whether he regrets having given it away for free. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but no, I agree. I mean, the thing about the, the multimedia production values, yeah, I, I, like exactly as, as, as Gro was saying, like, I'm personally, I'm less concerned about, I mean, I've seen some really good talks where, I know somebody who specializes in, and, and who spends like 800 euro on a mic or on lighting might, you know, cringe at it like that, but there's a good solid message and it's pedagogically, it's good. And it's so, I think it's what's, what, what's important there. And I think for me, uh, I mean, the thing with the OERs anyway, is how does this help the teaching and learning? How does this help meet the, the learning outcomes uh, for that? It's, it's, it's not a fashion show or a video show or whatever like that. That's, we probably rambled on a bit, Emmett, and I don't know if we've answered your, your question there. No, anything else coming in through, through YouTube or anywhere else? There was, um, there was another question from JJ who asked if you have a paper published, 
can you put an early version an earlier version of the published paper on say sword mm -hmm. or arrow um yeah and i'd be very aware like that there's um said hanrahan would be a real more expert in this what, what we're talking about the, the pre-published version is green open access um so when you sign up for 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 a journal you need to ensure that that you actually have permission um last year research gate had to take down 1.4 million papers uh, because the society for responsible publishing uh, insisted and the, the society for responsible publishing sounds a lovely title and it's a lovely neutral term it's actually paid for by elsevier and uh, blackwell and all of the other big publishing companies so yes you can but you just need to ensure that that uh what you're signing up for with that particular journal does allow preprint versions so it's a hard one to i can't give an exact uh, i can't give an exact uh an exact answer to that just check the small print um and the problem is like with, with open access is that there's a lot of increasing there's a lot of hybrid journals so journals are recognizing that they they're, they're going to give you the um the the option to publish open access for the on average it's about three thousand dollars to produce open access um so it, they appear to be given the the option of gold open access but uh, anyway, sorry, going back to preprints. Yes, it's green, but just make sure that the, that particular journal allows preprint versions. Any other, any other questions? Bueller. No, we're, we're nearly at the hour, I'd say. We might, yeah. We, we might cut our losses, Tom. Grand out, so yeah. Uh, so um, thanks again. I, you know, as I say, I think that was that was a really nice balance between giving people a sense of what it is and as, as an ideology, but just what it is as a really practical thing to do at the moment, where we're all kind of scrambling to try to put together online or remote teaching versions of our courses quickly. And uh, you know, why uh, why um, reinvent the, the wheel as it were? Absolutely. Somebody else has probably done it, and if they haven't done all of it, then you know, you can go more granular and look for. At least an image or some some bit of something that that you can remix uh, with your own content and uh, yeah no I, I, yeah as I said I think there was there was as I said there's a few people I follow and they produce a lot of really good YouTube videos and I've actually emailed them and they've gone and produced a, a, a video for what I, I because like they're often looking for ideas and what's new and necessary so you build up that rapport and uh, I mean these are people who obviously love making that. That stuff anyway there like that so uh you know I and by the way if you're looking for good videos uh just do a search for tom farley who uh is is genuinely really well known for can i say this tom for a, yeah. a thing called gosta which is this kind of uh high energy high participation uh format that he's uh taken around the world uh <laughs> hilarious uh hilarious stuff altogether uh, no, you want to add anything to that, there, Tom? But there are a good few of those videos out there now. There's a good few of the videos out there like that. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's it's uh, as actually this year, uh, thanks to Garode, um, it's it's a very high energy face to face format. But we took it online and uh, we done an event in April, which was viewed by fifty one countries around the world. Um, so yeah, and uh, if we twist his arm, we'll be doing another one shortly. <laughs> So no, but uh, look, just if I take one thing away, I think exactly, I, I couldn't agree more with Grow. Work smarter, not harder. And I think there's a lot of good resources out there. I think that's uh, the, the starting point, but also acknowledge that, you know, I'm sure you're doing a lot of good work and, you know, down the line, if you want to start sharing and, and turning that into, uh, as I said, it just could be a very useful PDF a little PowerPoint there like there. And I think also that in, in terms of just just getting your own message out there. Um just quickly there, I'm just watching the time there, but I use SlideShare. I don't know if people are familiar with SlideShare, but like as soon as I um, I present at a conference and, and ever, all the conferences will have a hashtag. So I I will put up hi everybody and here's a link and then the, I've been put the link in my Twitter uh, and, and and get it out there. And it's getting, you know, my slide share is getting hundreds of hits. Um, so apart from anything else, like, you know, um, I mean, they're OERs in that sense. 
like SlideShare is a great set of resources. I don't know if you had anything in it. There's some great stuff out there like that. So, but as I said, you know, don't be hiding your light under a bushel. And uh, I, I think as I said, on an individual level, I think it's a great way of doing stuff. And um, yeah, that's a good point there, Mary. I, I've emailed I've emailed the PowerPoint uh, presentation to to Garo, Mary. So uh hopefully that'll be uh, useful and but as i said and i do think as i said it, it gives the new university a chance to put its 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 own stamp on what we consider to be important in education Absolutely. and i will i will shut up now thanks a million tom uh mind yourself we'll be talking soon and uh thanks a million to everybody for coming along i know thank you very much yeah you've got a i hope uh people have found that of some interest and benefit Thanks very much.